it's quite amazing within the last 24 hours um, we have I think two major um, lectures from two major thinkers intellectuals from the United States um, West Coast and London represented by Liam Young whom I hope you all saw yesterday and uh, tonight East Coast Yale um, Kelly and, and all of this in, within 24 hours in Hall. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will never forget <laughs> Hawk, <laughs> a small village, <laughs> but a great school. Anyway, um, with tonight's ending lecture series in the Institute of Architecture, we would like to stimulate a debate of the diversity of natures. May they be historic, political, digital or fictive. If we understand architecture as a discipline which is responsible for designing and planning our lives environment, we cannot avoid confronting ourselves with a new and contemporary understanding of nature, which goes beyond our own discipline and which is pluralistic, diverse, and at the same time could appear in an ecological, political and technical way. With this lecture series, we also aim to find new narratives which are able to reflect the concept of natures from different disciplines and perspectives. After last, night, uh, after last night's brilliant, dystopian, and also, at least for myself, shocking lecture by Liam Young, Film director and architect from Tomorrow's Thoughts Today and Unknown's Unknown Fields Divisions from LA and London. I'm very excited and extremely honored to welcome and introduce tonight's guest. I have to apologize, the introduction will be short. Your CV is <laughs> endless, and the longer the CV, the shorter the introduction. I think that means something. Renowned architect, urbanist and writer Keller Easterling presents her work on the infrastructures, digital formulas, and urban policies that govern our lives and movements in the world, in the world. Drawing from a recent research publication, Medium Design. Uh, I mentioned your CV, just a, a few short spotlights. Um, Keller has graduated, graduated with a master's degree in architecture at Princeton University in 1984. Um, from 1988 to 93, um, she was an adjunct professor at Pratt Institute School of Design in New York. Before this, um, you already had um, several different teaching appointments. Um, since 1989, she is principal of Keller Easterling Architect in New York and um, taught at the Columbia GSAPP School of Architecture as an assistant professor from 93 to 98. Since 98, Keller Easterling is a professor at the Yale School of Architecture. Um, I'm sure you all have heard about um, the Yale School of Architecture, a beautiful building um, by Paul Rudolph, brutalist, uh, wonderful space, and a, one of the very, very fine and excellent schools in the world. She is currently, and I'm only naming one of a whole list, she is currently a United States Artists Fellow in Architecture and Design. As far as I know, you have in some of your courses a, an academic reading list and few texts from the um, book that was published in 2014, Extra Statecraft, um, should be to your knowledge. Extra statecraft, extra statecraft, the power of infrastructure space. Keller, I think I'll stop here again. Um, otherwise, I would take your time 
and this is what we're waiting for you to speak to us. Thank you very much for coming, and we're looking forward to your lecture. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction and for having me here. It's really a pleasure to be here and in, in, in Switzerland and a few different places, and especially here. Um, uh, so you're looking at a, a sort of movie trailer uh, made during the 2008 summit uh, that uh, the White House made, that Donald Trump offered to Kim Jong-un, a kind of a movie trailer, trailer style projection of North Korea after the floodgates had been opened to the global marketplace. And the global press found these sort of Hollywood stylings inexplicable, but Trump was really only offering the common currency of contemporary global real estate and trade. It's really just another of hundreds of, of similar examples produced in render farms of real estate and infrastructure kingdoms all over the world. And they're always the same, sort of with the, the repetition and monotony of porn. They're like three minute cliches of global urbanism. They, they usually always begin in outer space as a new era is dawning and then typically in a city below, there's a Star Wars style fly through uh, that threads through fields of digital skyscrapers sprouting from the ground before swinging over industrial areas and container ports and resorts. And, and there's a deep movie trailer voice that's announcing all the neoliberal mantras of free trade, no taxes, cheap labor, streamlined customs, and deregulation of labor and environmental law. What a feeling from flash dance plays as one video advertises its city's um, back of house, or a Yanni-like soundtrack accompanies magnificent claims of world city urbanity that are enjoyed by doughy cartoon humans that are rhythmically waddling along these boulevards or, or plowing forward stone-faced in pleasure boats, or a population of villas flips into place <laughs> And you know the same flyovers of these identical uh, uh, sort of candy-colored world, and then there's a dramatic finale with the to the theme of Titanic that that sort of backs out into the stratosphere past fireworks and orbiting satellites and bursting <laughs> hearts and confetti and so on. So the DPRK had already been making its own kind of ecstatic videos that were mapping. Um, existing or projected economic zones for industry or tourism, either on the East Coast or, or on the border with Russia and China. And those two were sort of <coughs> frantically shifting through harps and organ polkas and patriotic marches and lullabies and bongo interludes. So this is the free zone that I've studied, uh, a form that's legally um, it's legalized its exemption from law, a form that privileges the freedom of corporations and offshore finance, and sweetened with these incentives and bathed in um, an elaborate promotional fantasies, it has become a massive global infrastructure installation of corporate capital. It's a major engine of inequality, of labor abuse, and environmental brinksmanship. But Trump and Kim of the zone, they're way ahead of any, everyone. They know that contemporary urbanism seems to be largely driven by two cultural addictions, by revenue streams and mediagenic fantasies. So this is, this is the kind of space I study. And I always say that what I'm doing <coughs> could be called something like medium design, because I'm looking sort of with half-closed eyes at the urban world. Yes, focusing on buildings with shapes and outlines, but also on the matrix of rules and relationships in which those buildings are kind of suspended. And in a contemporary experience economy, that matrix is, as you well know, made up of repeatable formulas or spatial products, skyscrapers, malls, golf courses, resorts, franchises, parking lots, airports, ports, free zones, and these almost 
infrastructural rules and relationships. When I say infrastructure, I don't mean an, like an infrastructure of pipes and wires under the ground, but an all too visible enveloping urban medium or a spatial technology, something like multiple spatial operating systems for the city. And it's this, this technical, technological matrix that is arresting because of its wild mixtures of, of, of candy-colored fairy tales and, and quite grisly abuse, because it's a secret weapon of stealthy political power, because it's creating de facto forms of polity that are outside of law. Um, these zones are outside of the jurisdiction of domestic law. And, and because it's rapidly generating a new layer of the Earth's crust. But what I want to talk about tonight is some ideas that I'm struggling with in a, in a new book called Medium Design. And so I hope that, it, that the, the next little part will be clear. If, if it isn't, you, you must take issue. <laughs> I'll, I'll go s as slowly as I can, but I, I'm trying to think through something, and I hope that's OK. Um, these spaces and the, the powers that preside over them have often become what we might call political superbugs, um, you know, like resistant strains of organism, S things that survive against all odds to generate unchecked concentrations of power, extremes of inequality, and climate cataclysms. And, and now, it may be because I'm from the United States and we have such a brilliant example of a superbug, but, but it, it, it's, it's boring now just to measure and describe it one more time. Um, uh, and so one wants to kind of move beyond the rhetorical critique that's to be consumed in another venue of cultural production, you know, another Biennale or something. Um, because I think we as, as spatial practitioners who've gone out with every other discipline, uh, and has been per as perplexed as any other by these conditions, I, I still hold out the hope that we offer to our allied disciplines <coughs> some form of design activism, you know, some forms with, to actually manipulate the physical world, not, not just depict it. But here's sort of the difficult part. Um, the, taking stock of what it is we have in culture to unwind the power of the superbug. Um, and just saying the simplest, most obvious things. You could say that culture is good at pointing to things and calling their name, but not so good at describing the relationships between things or the repertoires that things enact, like, like what's going on in that matrix I was trying to describe. And it's a, you know, it's a, Maybe it's still an old modern enlightenment mind that's still replacing God with ideologies that privilege declarations and right answers and universals and elementary particles. We are still following modernist scripts about newness. Um, it's a mind that's maybe looking for the one or the one and only and, and so maybe it's still a mind that's kind of organized like a closed loop that only wants to circulate compatible information and, and can't abide by contradiction. And when it's challenged, lashes out with a binary. So the new right answer must kill the old right answer. And it's, you, you can see it in a broader culture, but you can also see it in an individual because we, we are creatures that have somehow trained our mind to want to be right, to have the right answer. You know, and we will, all of us, you know, go to bed tonight thinking about how we were, how we were right all along about everything. Um, so it, it, is it a culture that's, that's oscillating between loops and binaries? Um, and, and because of that, often banging away with this same blunt, inadequate tools. So when, we, so when there is a superbug, a superbug is elected, when there is a migration of refugees that swells in number, when shorelines flood due to global warming, what do we have? Um, you know, we have 
um, our new technological solutions, we have military engagement, um, but if those things don't work, what, what do we have? We have the consensus surrounding laws and standards and master plans, but when those don't provide any relief, it still seems as if the smartest people in the face of even incredible stupidity of super, super bugs are, are standing with hand to brow. Um, and we also have these elaborate ideas that there should be one, one huge revolution or apocalyptic burnout that will somehow solve everything. Um, and these are the kind of hackneyed plot lines of our humanities. Um, and even dissent sometimes adopts that, that loop and binary of enemies and innocents. And since superbugs thrive on that kind of rancor, when you fight them, all you're doing is nourishing them. <laughs> so, so then what? You know, how, how do you somehow drop through a trap door to engage some other logics? Um, and and, and in, in the typical cadence, uh, you know, this would usually be the moment where you're supposed to r r unleash your radical new proposal. But on, on the flip side of those logics, that would be quite sad. That, you know, there's nothing new and nothing right. Um, maybe there's only a chance to rehearse a very ordinary habit of mind. It's a blind spot in culture, but one that's right in front of us. Or it's a, a terra incognita, but one where we've already been. And, and what I'm trying to propose is that it's a faculty that designers have in abundance. That it's that faculty to see with half-closed mm -hmm. eyes to see at a different focal length, to see beyond declared ideologies to that matrix or medium of activities and latent potentials. Um, I think we're good at that. Um, I teach at Yale um, a lot of students who I'm sure are going to be you know, kind of budding McKinsey and Deloitte consultants who can only understand <laughs> econometrics and law and so on, certain technical languages. But my architecture students have an ability to think correlatively. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it, it's their way of thinking that I, I hold out some hope that they can see this matrix, um, what I'm calling medium, but but using the using medium not uh, going back to the root of the word me, to the root the root medius uh, so clear of associations with communication technologies now talking about uh, that word as it means middle or milieu um, so I'm wondering if um, just as you are inverting a typical focus on object to look at field um, could it offer some alternative approaches to some of our intractable problems or a way to outwit some superbugs? Um, so it, is the English okay? Is it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I, and I think designers are good at this. I, th I think we have something almost like a canine mind where your dog hears you say the words, good girl, and the, it's, you know, she understands the lexical expression after a while, but she would never rely on, on the declared lexical expression. She's looking at all the other things in the room, how close you are to the, to the door or the dog bowl or whether you have a leash in your hand, even you know, your temperament. Um, and so I, I think that it, so you're, she can sort of see in a split screen in that way. So, i um, wondering if it helps to turn the sound down on some of the declarations, our ideological declarations, and, and, and make it easier to detect the difference between what an organization is saying and what it's doing. Um, so these are so, some of the most obvious ones, um, um, like the stories of socio-technical organizations like those I study, whether they're railroads or hydroelectric networks or blockchains like Ethereum, um, usually the story is about 
decentralization and freedom. You know, that's always the next format is found the main to be, you know, the means to be uh, perfectly democratic and free. Um, but often in those organizations, the real disposition of the organization, the way it's really organized, is, is frequently concentrating power and authority, often making monopolies. Or they consider what, you know, what we call the smart city um, that you know, maintains the shine of a new, even when we know now that what, apart from what it says it's doing, what it's actually doing is centralizing information in ways that violate privacy and in ways that create not a smart, but a quite, quite a primitive and crude network in its organization. Or think about a social media network that says it's information rich, but it's really filtering all that information through a dumb binary of likes and dislikes that actually erases information, that makes it information poor, even violent. Or that global network of Dubai-style zone cities that I'm looking at, their message is free trade. Um, but it's not free trade. It's obviously manipulated trade. Or a centralizing power espouses a populist message. Or you can see a left-wing ideology and a right-wing ideology at some points in history um, resulting in concentrations of authoritarian power. So, the, so suddenly it's not the ideology that helps you understand what's going on. It's understanding some kind of undeclared disposition that seems to be determining the outcome. And if you go back to the superbug, it, it, I think they have a special power at manipulating ideologies, but their real target is dispositions. So I hope this doesn't start to get uh, too confusing. But um, they want to keep everyone oscillating between loops and binaries. That's where they kind of cocoon and thrive. But like a confidence man, they're also masters of lies and distractions. So they, they know that, for instance, telling one lie is a really bad idea. If you tell one lie, it's really easy to reconcile and figure out who's guilty or whatever. But if you tell many lies, you start to create, you almost turn a lexical expression into something physical, almost like a kind of Teflon on which rationality starts to slip and slide. So all of the, it's kind of running rings around all the earnest people who, who believe what other people say. Um, uh, and so the superbug can all make lies bounce and lubricate and dance around. Um, they almost become that pure medium, some kind of activity divorced from content. And so here's a sort of a tricky moment then. Like even take inter interference in the 2016 election in the United States. So whoever was doing it, um, they were using ideological tools with an intent to shape not ideology but disposition. So, in the so they were sending out counterfeit messages that were fomenting racism. So if you were an ideological activist, you had no choice but to go and march in the streets against this hate, against this racism. But once you did that, the way that the, those um, sort of lies and distractions were positioned, you were exacerbating a binary in culture that delivered Trump. So you were following your ideological position, but you were delivering something that was um, the opposite of your own ideological belief. And that's the, that's the brilliant trick that the superbug does. So it seems wildly dangerous to rely only on declared ideology when it can, when it can accumulate untouchable power and environmental forms of violence. And, the, and if it's not already obvious, I see that written in space, that it's architecture and urbanism that is making some of these radical changes to the globalizing world. So I, th I think our ability to read some latent potentials is profoundly under-rehearsed. 
And on this, on this flip side, on the other side of a kind of trap door, there is also some, some expectations might be inverted. So um, one inversion might be that being right is a really bad idea. It's too weak. It doesn't work against um, super bugs. Um, so we, we come along as architects and designers with our master plans, with our solutions. Um, and I think those are weak positions. Um, so on this kind of flip side, um, this work is wondering whether there's not another organ of design that in, where we can register our design imagination. So it, this work is looking at quite practically, and I'll get to some practical examples, um, <laughs> quite practically looking at organs of interplay. Like, what would it mean to design? Again, we're really good at designing shape and outline. But what if what you were designing was n not a, a building or a master plan, even though we're good at that and we should be good at that? But what if, in addition to that, we were able to design forms of interplay? Um, so it, it's a little bit less like designing an object and more like having your hands on the faders and toggles of organization. Um, designing chemistries and um, interactions. Designing not just one object, but designing how objects interact with each other. So almost like, uh, maybe a little bit like software in that way. Um, um, so medium design, uh, would then also be something like playing pool, where knowing, a, knowing the right answer doesn't do you, you can't know the right answer to playing pool. You, you, knowing one fixed sequence doesn't do you any good. But being able to respond to a branching network of possibilities allows you to add more information to the table. So these forms of interplay that, that we've been working with and that I, that I want to see what you think about are, have a long temporal dimension. They're not the master plan that you deliver, dust off your hands, and leave. They are forms of interplay that set up interdependencies between components of a city and then continue to rearrange them to respond to changing conditions or to respond to the moment when you're politically outmaneuvered. Um, in another inversion, it's while we usually think of eliminating problems as the best thing, in, on this, in medium design, um, you don't really want to eliminate problems. Maybe you want to multiply them. Uh, something like um, Pirando's paradox, which is a kind of counterintuitive game theory that says if you play two losing, if you play alternate between two losing games, you can generate wins. Um, so maybe it's not the existence of problems, but the way we use problems to to uh, together. In another inversion, um, it's not the newness or succession of technologies that's important, but um, instead sort of rejecting the idea of uh, one technology replaces an, the incumbent, a new technology replaces an incumbent technology. Um, instead, um, especially now at a moment of digital ubiquity, looking at it does, this medium design treats heavy, lumpy physical space, the stuff we're good at, um, as an information system itself. It's not looking for, to sensors and digital devices to make this stiff world dance. Instead, it's saying it's already dancing with potentials, like all of you who are good urbanists already know um, that this room, this chair, this table, the way we are arranged is a set of, uh, they're performing. All of their affordances, all the things that they allow each other. When you go down the street, you see um, all of the solids of the world computing, performing um, in, a, in an information system. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then finally, maybe the last inversion is that in this medium design, um, while while culture is usually addicted to writing its stories around big events, wars, 
gunshots, drawn swords, etc. But in the kind of space I look at, um, you know, this is Rana Plaza, which was a collapse of one of the most abusive, this is in the Dhaka export processing zone, it's in one of these zones. Mm -hmm. This is in Bangladesh. Um, so this was a, a terrible disaster where the building collapsed. Um, but um, in factories that don't, don't happen to collapse under the weight of their violence and denial, um, and that's most of the spaces that I'm looking at, the violence, there is no violence of drawn sword or gunshot. It's a, it's a, it's a violence of a kind of latent temperament, um, the constant aggressions of imbalanced power dynamics. Um, take, take a look, if you pan the camera to the side, those are the onlookers looking at that collapse. And, and, and you all, who are good at, at techniques and so on, see the violence in that image, in the thinness of that slab, in the, the chiseling. Um, or if we pan way back out in Bangladesh, you can see the violence of an extremely shallow floodplain that, that races into the interior and displaces people, um, you know, sending people to, to the DACA export processing zone. So I suppose in this case, we've now talked about dogs and, and pool players. Um, you could talk about uh, parent, like the parents with squabbling children who, who, when they have two kids arguing in the next room, they don't uh, try to litigate that argument, but instead um, um, introduce blood sugar into one child, introduce a pet into the arms of another, uh, separate them, uh, open a window. So it's th that ability to sometimes <coughs> change that latent temperament, which I also think we might be good at um, as architects. Um, so, so maybe it, uh, we can look at some examples of this interplay so in case I worry that it might be too abstract in what I'm saying. Um, but think of a place like Nairobi where the same uh, videos are appearing. And um, this is a country that just received in 2010, 11, um, broad, broadband capacity. It's when the cables landed in Mombasa. Um, and now it's flush with broadband capacities and a, a big share of the world's uh, billions of cell phone users. Now you know that's been flipped. It's the if what we used to call the Global South now has more uh, cell phone users. And while this potentially changes everything, they're getting the same cocktail of master plans and standards and econometrics, global consultants, and you know, the 28-year-old McKinsey consultant is seeing them, the same <laughs> blunt instruments. So what if in Nairobi you could use the zone's ambition to be a city as the germ of its own reversal. So some places, like Dubai, they actually did do that. They made access to their resources like oil and gas contingent on um, a kind of offset. They said you can have access if you invest in some other things we need, like desalination or fish farming or something like that. So a city like Nairobi might make a better bargain with their assets assets like access to those cell phone users by using foreign investment um, not on newly minted ex-urban shiny cities uh, and enclaves but to leverage benefits for the city itself what if you broke the cycle of of the free zone and this is a, just a, a kind of time-lapse cartoon which shows the, the the temporal dimension of an interplay but what if an interplay could link investment, which is in blue, you know, a kind of shiny ex-urban city? Um, what if it could link this investment in blue to some shared resources? So if this is Nairobi, the sort of grid. So it could be linked to anything. But this little cartoon is imagining that it's linked to transit that's in red. Um, Nairobi desperately needs transit. So the transit would benefit the city 
while also delivering workers to businesses. In the, at the edges of these shiny cities are crumbling roads and workers who've been walking for hours. Um, um, so, so then you could ask the question, you know, would this kind of rewiring potentially uh, return more direct benefits to the financial economy? Um, and then perhaps more importantly, uh, if you're thinking also about changing temperament, is it reducing violence to workers by returning them to the protections and regulations of law? So this is an architect as an activist. It's not, it's not, it, it's, it's not that one isn't um, uh, <coughs> adhering to an ideology in some ways, but the, the, the move is more dispositional, more of a, um, a change to the medium. So how do you diagram these kinds of things that aren't master plans, they aren't solutions, in fact they're things that shouldn't always work, because not because they're marginal or weak, but because they need to be agile enough um, and with sufficient temporal dimension to adapt to the next thing Nairobi needs. Or, as we were saying, respond to the moment when somebody figures out how to cheat you back. All of this, sorry, you, you all probably know that um, this is a time lapse that you're looking at, but it's a slow one. But you all probably know that the, the spatial products and repeatable formulas that I was showing you earlier, everything from buildings to entire cities, um, that we were saying is rapidly generating a new layer of the Earth's crust. Most of it is, is existing now and exploding. Oops, it's not playing. Um, in ex exploding um, urban periphery. So I'll speed it up. Um, I mean, this is happening in the last few, few um, years <coughs> where the urban periphery is, is, is becoming immense but also less dense. Um, so the, the uh, urban land is increasing, but the population on that urban land is decreasing so it's, and staggering in size. So that in 2050, the projection is that the size of that kind of urban periphery uh, in, around the world will be the size of the entire country of India. And all this development is, is you know, contributing to global warming that is uh, increasingly self-evident, accelerating like a speeding freight train, but governments around the world are defying global pacts to alleviate the situation. Um, so here's another interplay which, is, um, which will seem you know, completely inadequate. Um, in, the, in the spring, I'm going to give lectures which are just looking at scores of these interplays, just to rehearse the idea of it, but maybe this one will rehearse rehearse a little bit. So we know in, um, uh, that you know, roads are typically regarded as conduits of, of progress and opportunity in rural or wilderness areas. Um, but they can also, you also know that that's the way in which encroachment on the forest usually happens is through those roads. Um, so this is looking at the way in which digital and spatial platforms could make each other more information rich or more information poor. And this little protocol is considering an interplay between roads and broadband and forest or jungle. So it's saying, what happens if you dial down roads to preserve, uh, that you dial down roads as you dial up broadband um, and preserve forest or jungle that uh, draws new global institutions, either research institutions or the sort of cliched uh, eco-tourism, um, and, and brings that it also happens to be broadband hungry. So finding an interplay between components that, um, uh, and also demonstrating that changing a road as well as changing a bit of code can, can hack a telecommunications network. Or Automated vehicles are touted as the means to perfect driving. This is one of these kind of silly, soft focus ads. I'm sparing you the soundtrack. 
um, <laughs> but it, you know, which looks as this kind of pure embrace of technology. Um, but we know very well that there's a boomerang effect. If people use cars in lieu of transit uh, for the same hands-free ride, just imagine every seat in a transit car is now the size of a car, there'll be unprecedented congestion. And the modern mind says, oh, well, now we'll get the new solution like a flying car or something. <laughs> Um, but what if you said that's not what's sophisticated? What's sophisticated is the relationship between technologies, as we were saying before. Um, so um, would it be something less like a, a new solution, um, but an alternate response would be to alter the relationship between technologies or um, e e even rewire them with a spatial variable um, uh, a way to switch between low capacity automated vehicles and high capacity transit. Um, and even though we think of switching as something that is inconvenient, it would be a kind of release into entanglement, the speed of entanglement. Well, here's one more. Um, if you all are still okay, with, would you like to hear one? Okay. Um, so this global infrastructure that we've been looking at, you know, perfectly streamlines the movements of billions of products, tens of millions of tourists and cheap laborers, but at a time when over 70 million people in the world are displaced, there's somehow no ingenuity for moving X million people away from atrocities like those in Syria. The nation state has a dumb on-off button to grant or deny citizenship, the extra state layers of governance like the angiocracy offer as their best idea, storage in a refugee camp, which is a form of retention <laughs> lasting on average 17 years. So this was a project that looks like an app, but it really isn't an app. It was a, a <coughs> platform for rehearsing what would happen if you could introduce more spatial variables into global governance. So. Um, we were working with uh, a platform that would show how to facilitate migration through an exchange of needs. No haves, have nots, no hosts and guests, but just need to need exchanges. So m matchmaking needs and failures, again, like with, with Perando's paradox, putting problems together, um, time and opportunities for training um, uh, that would facilitate temporary movements and returns, or strings of, of uh, <coughs> journeys. So it was a platform who were speaking for those who might say, um, who might say, excuse me, you know, I don't really want your citizenship. <laughs> I, I don't want your victimhood, or your structured racism, or your bad jobs. I don't want to stay in your country. So kind of temperamentally, as we were talking about the parent before, it kind of, it leaves the right wing to kind of throw themselves against an open door and it steals their best argument and turns it on its head. So this is looking at a way in which um, you, you could perform um, some operations that cities and travelers could exchange, make exchanges for mutual benefits and also new forms of global credentials. Um, and we were not so naive as to, no, I mean, that we, the visa game is fraught and dangerous. This is not a sunny one world sharing app. It's just, it's in fact a heavy information system. Um, and, you know, to, to start to engage in these things is to enter into a world of embarrassment. Um, nothing works. And to worry that it will go wrong misses the point. Of course, we were very worried about that. but. Things will always go wrong. Maybe you can only try to achieve varying degrees of, of relief. Um, and then finally, just thinking back to the superbug skills of discrepancy. Um, while we're bored with the safety of the purely rhetorical, maybe the design that has any hope of affecting change is working on the organization, is under the hood of those organizations but also knows how to send in a sneaky story that goes with it. Um, something that, however non-physical, has physical consequences. Something that makes an invention contagious. 
because of its cuteness, its creepiness, its violence, <coughs> some kind of bounce, a stealthier form of activism that mixes spatial change with all of those gifts and pandas and rumors and and meaningless distractions that seem to be so effective in culture. So I suppose this medium design is just wondering if there's a way to get on with it um, and get around the modern mind um, with, with work where you know, right answers are mistakes, obligations are more empowering than freedom, histories follow latent aggressions as well as gunshots. You deliberately address problems with responses that shouldn't always work, and maybe you can steal some of the power of this um, <coughs> super bug space. And, and maybe like a really good pool player, you wouldn't call your shots, but kind of keep them guessing, or be too smart to be right. Thank you. In the beginning of your talk, you said you think that we as designers of planners are possibly or potentially good at influencing interactions kind of as a long term solid almost like a strategy game that you describe. Yet at the same time you say that there is like idealism can't guide us anymore. It would make us go wrong. There's no such thing as being right anymore. So what's if we are to act or try and intervene as planners. What's our guiding star, so to say? I'm wondering if, um, in addition to our ideologies, we might be attuned to other things. Um, so while we can all agree that we would be opposed to the abuse of beings and the environment, that's kind of like the easy part. You know, we we can agree to that, and then what? Um, and, uh, so it's not to the exclusion of ideology, but something beyond ideology, because that's that's what the superbugs are. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I know I'm simplifying, but um, that's what they're very good at manipulating all the stuff that is undeclared. Right. That I think we 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 know about yeah. more than many. that we can see relationships, we can see potentials mm -hmm. in solids. Um, yeah. you know, so it's not aiming lower, it's more like aiming right, farther. Right, right. Anyway. Maybe even beyond. fueled by an ideological belief, but going yeah. beyond that, not relying just on, so not relying just on the placard that says, I oppose, you know, uh, I oppose abuse of labor, mm -hmm. you know, but seeing what uh, what is in our capacity to change that, maybe even in undeclared ways that are kind of sneaky. Mm -hmm. you know? Two can play at that game. Yeah. How would you define the, an ethic guidelines? I mean, it cannot be completely open, what you're saying. So there has to be. And how, how would you define those things that probably at the end this is the most difficult question? Problem, at least for me. So how would you define that? What can we do or what can't we do as designers? Well, um, look, take, take the case of Ni Nairobi, for instance. I mean, there are some huge, gross things <laughs> that, that, would, that would change things enormously, you know, right? to, um, yeah, to redirect that foreign investment. Um, and in ways that that benefited the domestic economy and and uh, supported workers. Um, I mean, there's probably many ways to do that, um, but but one of them is spatial. Uh, um, so so I'm not I'm not saying that there aren't that this is uh, an abandonment of ethical principles far from it, uh, not an acceptance of, a blind acceptance of, of ethical principles, but it's, you know, there, there's ethics as declaration of principles, then there's ethics as struggle, and this is more in the ethics of struggle. And I think it's also not for everyone, you know. I think it's for, I, I have the sense from 
certainly from my students, that they're now wanting some other way to rehearse other forms of practice, um, not, some of them not even um, client-based practices. So they're, they're looking for a, a way to engage in another way um, because of their strong ethical beliefs. I think you said that foreign investment can be kind of traded off against access to like knowledge of cell phone networks, local kind of trading local information against foreign investment. Or making the, making the investment contingent on something Nairobi needs and wants. So, um, so uh, there are often um, in incentives offered to investment. Um, sure. So th there's nothing, you know, this would, this would be already way too impure for my mm -hmm. Marxist friends, you know. Um, but, uh, um, it, but u using that incentive for not just as a total giveaway, which is the way it is now, um, okay. uh, but using it to, for something to curate something that the city needs, and which could, you know, tangentially uh, benefit the investor. Um, it doesn't, you know, um, like transit. Um, which is that require political actors rather than spatial planning? Well, y yes, yes, but um, I it's why I, I'm wondering why are spatial variables not part of global governance? More, have, why do they not have more authority in global governance? Mm -hmm. um, the the way I mean, you see UN Habitat um, kind of now has discovered the street, you know, um, <laughs> and they discovered that you know, of course, they still have to. Uh, do all these GDP metrics and stuff because that's what they do, um, and it's super consent. But, but they, um, they're discovering that there are urban relationships that that make huge differences. Um, that it's solid to solid that sometimes changes value. They're, they're g I didn't show that. Uh, there's a whole lot of interplays that I'm sort of gathering now in a collection, um, but one of them is. Um, ways in which they're, you know, changing some of the, that exploding urban periphery by <coughs> it, finding ways to insert, you all know this, but you know, finding ways to insert infrastructure uh, in ways that change value um, through a spatial arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, I have many questions, very difficult to articulate. I mean, I'm uh, quite shocked, <laughs> like yesterday, but can we, in the near future, can we really steer, you know, can we move the ship in a different direction? Can we really do it? Or is it, is it on, a, on a track that, you know, is, is kind of given? I think it would be pretty easy to say it is on a track that's given and that there's no way to change it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> um, it, no, it, 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 uh, it may be, you know, looking at the, the, those students that I teach that I was talking about, you know, um, and some of them are going to be 23-year-olds who are given the keys, you know, to make glo glo decisions of global governance, um, and they aren't the smartest ones in the room, you know. <laughs> it's, it's these designs, my design students who are better thinkers, who can think through things, who can see across categories, um, and can see um, the way in which all kinds of value can be created, the ways in which all kinds of um, violence might be reduced, just in arrangement. Um, and so uh, you can try. Um. There's a, there's a um, book that has been published, I think, in 2014. I forgot the title and I forgot the authors. It's been it's coming from a um, Harvard professor. Um, it's about climate change or the I think the decline of Western society or something like this. 
the statement is that we're, you know, we're running towards uh, this pivotal point, 2000, whatever, 93, mm -hmm. where everything is going down. And it is, it's, a, it's a dystopian book, dystopian fiction, um, <coughs> writing basically from the future, 300 years ahead, out of China. Right? It's, it's American authors, and basically their statement is that only non-democratic societies can really change something. And really, you know, maybe they are superbugs themselves, but they can, they can fight super, super bugs. Uh, they, can, um, they can make their people stop flying. They can make their people stop driving cars or eating meat. Um, this versus a kind of a democratic system you know, where we, it seems, well, this is the thesis in the book, that uh, democratic systems basically have no power. Well, uh, one of the things I didn't didn't say, which is a sort of a premise of looking at these repeatable formulas, it, it, you know, those all the repeatable formulas I was showing you at the beginning of this talk are things we don't in our profession, our discipline has set those to the side. Mm -hmm. They they're not that that's the kind of fire hose blast of the way the world is actually being made, being made to space. Um, but we are working in another register. Um, and so the, the basic premise from extra statecraft was, what, well, what if we do know something about that? Um, and what if, um, uh, because it is space after all, and, and what if, because it comes with so many multipliers, like the multipliers of a totalitarian regime, can, can, is there power in reverse engineering it you know, in other words, does it come with its own amplification device? That if you change something in it, if you know how to change it, that it will multiply itself. Um, so a lot of the interplays, I didn't show them here, but a lot of the interplays that thinking about are re rehearsing that possibility. Um, you know, reverse engineering a, a form of sprawl with a, with a new mortgage, with a new way of grouping mortgages. or. Um, um, yeah, it is, actually any of these, I suppose, could become, like, if that, if that zone formula became contagious, anything that moves through the zone network becomes contagious. At one point, they all had to have Macau-style colored fountains, and then, like, all, all of them had <laughs> Macau-style colored So, like, what is the story, um, the kind of crazy story that moves through that population of of zones again now, and would it could it recondition them in another way? Um, I know it's hopeful thinking, um, uh, but I don't see any choice. Um. So that would be the absolute opposite of what the book was that Johannes mentioned was describing, kind of a sub subversive force of hopeful, let's say, planners hacking into political power. Mm -hmm. Right. right. But I mean, there's this, um, I, I also don't know the author, but I, I was reading about a, a sociological theory that has uh, the th three to five percent rule. That means if you want to change society, you don't need 51 percent of the society to make a new way or to vote for something. And sometimes it's enough to have three uh, up to five percent, but it should, should go through all the range of the society and they should try something else and then it's able to, to multiply. And the examples I was reading about was, for example, the, the, the uh, fe feminist movement. That was just a small group, but they w were introducing the new topic and they made it strong and it was uh, right through all the, 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 the society. And then it, a change was creating all that. And that, that would mean, like, start an important smory, a story in, in a small group and then try to multiply and it should be enough. Do you see, I mean, look at it, it's, it sounds like it's a little bit a global phenomena that's all over it's the same. Do you see any cultural difference or differences in culture in dealing with these uh, superbugs? The, 
Well, the, even the zone formula is wildly different in different contexts, in, in kingdoms and in totalitarian. I mean, it has some, it has some, not wildly different, but because it, it has some, the core thing that they all share is that uh, it's privileging uh, corporate um, and offshore finance and to the, ex to the detriment of the worker and, and, and the domestic economy. Um, with these exceptions, um, but other than that, the, it, it is, is very. I mean, it can be different in um, in different countries, but it, but but you still see, um, you know, like HP, you know, how, or any of these corporations that you could mention, all headquarter in a network of these zones, and they have the privileges that they've grown accustomed to in. These zones, and if you're a country that, um, you know, like Nairobi, that has 40% unemployment, you don't have a choice. You know, you, if you want to attract that business, those jobs, and that's the that's the place where it is cruelly conforming, um, even though the contexts are so different and could be so different. So you would say the differences are more on the surface than really in the core. Yeah, I mean the formulas. I mean the formulas for a for an automated port. I mean that's just that's you know it's not there's not going it's not going to be inflected <laughs> by, by uh, indigenous culture or something. <laughs> yeah, um, um, the zone videos try to make it sound like it will be. You know they lay on these other stories, but but. Um, What's physically there is done by global companies that do a, that repeat that. Um, uh, global companies that do the rep a repetitive uh, um, uh, dormitory formula for the workers. And, um. Can I would very much like to thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you for um, listening. <laughs> it's a great pleasure, and I propose that we. Open the bar and have a drink. <laughs> Thank you very much.